My mother warned me that I may be talking myself out of my salvation. <laughs> Maybe so. After all, this is a humanist meeting. Some years ago, there was an eruption, a blast, which blew away much of a mountain face, and from the very bowels of the earth, a column of ash rose 15 miles into the atmosphere. An earthquake was part of the chaos. Then there was an avalanche, a huge avalanche. The top quarter mile of the mountain just slid off. This mountain was now a quarter mile shorter than it had been just a few minutes earlier. You know, there's a, this famous Hollywood line where some bandito is um, confronted and he says, badges, we don't need no stinking badges. Well, that's sort of the way I feel today about, uh, about this. I, here I am, I'm without a, a PowerPoint, and you did such a nice job there, Virginia, but. Uh, Anytime you want, so, I'll help you. So PowerPoint, <laughs> we don't need no stinking PowerPoint. I got, I got papers here. <laughs> <laughs> Scientists studied the plate tectonics. They believe they have understanding of the history of this volcano. Available ash evidence dates back 40,000 years. They named the eruptive stages. They drew conclusions from the pumice that was left there. And a timeline of seismic activity and dormancy was established. So you might be thinking, is this guy talking about Mount St. Helens? And if you think so, you're right. It's in the state of Washington and this May 1980 eruption was both destructive and deadly. As far as U.S. history goes, it was the most devastating volcanic eruption that we know of. 57 humans were killed, over 200 homes were lost, almost 200 miles of highway was lost, and so many bridges were also destroyed, and railroad tracks were destroyed. During this one eight hour workday for this volcano, it blew ash to an elevation of 15 miles, as I said, and ash was inches deep, even 50 miles from the event. In addition to the human death toll, thousands of large animals and millions of fish died. Mount St. Helens was not finished yet. 25 years later, 2005, it reminded us that it still has potential. It blew ash six miles into the air and shook us with another earthquake. Now, American Indians, they had various legends about Mount St. Helens. One is of a god chief called Taihi Sahali. This chief and his two sons were out looking for a place to call home. And being a chief, of course, he said, how? No. He said, where? Where are we going to live? And this uh, happened to be in a place they called the Bridge of the Gods. When they found this beautiful place, his two sons both wanted to live there. And there was a confrontation, so he knew exactly what to do. He shot two arrows, one to the north and one to the south, and his sons had to live where the arrows landed, which potentially was 100 miles apart. The boys had to settle where those arrows fell. So, how did you choose where you live now? Think about it. How did you choose that? Maybe next time, if it didn't work out, next time, try shooting an arrow. That may work out for you. Now a love story comes into play. Both sons fall in love with the same very old woman. Well, why would they do that? The Lady of Fire was an ancient woman, except that she had been granted eternal life. And she had been transfigured into a young beauty. 
The boy's ferocious fight over her was destructive to nature. So the god chief, Tai Sahali, solved the problem. He transformed his, these sons, these troublemaking sons, into mountains. One, one son became Mount Hood. The other son became Mount Adams. And their love interest, she became what we know as Mount St. Helens. <laughs> She was, um, well, anyway, here we see examples of humans making gods, creating gods in their own minds. And there were reasons for humans to have these myths. Anyway, Mount St. Helens, destructive? Yeah? Well, not so much. Consider this. It was June 1991, after hundreds of years of tranquility, when the great... Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted. This monster killed over 800 humans and displaced over 1 million people from their homes. Its ash traveled around the world. Our atmosphere, now laden with all of this ash, cooled the earth by about 2 degrees Fahrenheit. There's Pinatubo. Now, of course, the Philippine natives also had legends. One was Baco Baco. Now, when I uh, mentioned this to my wife, Jackie, she said, Baco Baco? Well, you have to pronounce it like this, Baco Baco. So, please, bear with me, and let's pronounce Baco Baco. Come on. Baco Baco. Baco, Baco. That's it. <laughs> he was the spirit of the sea. He would sometimes become a giant turtle. When Baco Baco felt threatened, he would go to the mountain and dig a hiding spot as fast as he could. This, of course, flipped out a lot of dirt and rock and, and mud. And oh, did I mention Baco Baco would shoot flames from his mouth. That was how the Philippines the Filipinos uh, interpreted this. <clears throat> Human imagination at work again. Now, I'm not going to try to make fun of this flawless belief system. It was important to them. So, Pinatubo, destructive, huh? Not so much. If the volcanic activity of the Hawaiian island chain had been quick and on dry ground, with a human population present, the destruction would absolutely dwarf what we've talked about so far. Do you know how big a square mile is? Pretty big. Mile this way, mile that way. Imagine maybe a hundred of those. That's a lot of territory. The Nuwanu debris field covers 9,000 square miles of ocean floor. It's beyond comprehension. And again, there's a religious aspect. Hawaiians still pray to, and even make offerings to, the fire goddess Pele. Probably right now we can find people chanting as they look up toward Kilauea. Now I didn't know, Victor, when uh, I went to Hawaii. There's somebody here that I was with in Hawaii, but um, you tell me if this sounds like Victor. Muscles rippling, wearing a grass skirt, maybe a coconut bra, no, no, no. <laughs> but carrying a bouquet. Was that you, Victor? Was that you at that yeah, time? Yeah, oh, that was him. Okay, I, I thought I recognized him. And thank you for letting me have fun at your expense. Mahalo. Okay. Now, I don't know who this guy is, but the cup says Coke. Uh, I have a feeling, though, that maybe sobriety is not his forte. But there he is. He's uh, dressed for the part. Let's look at something bigger still. The Cambrian explosion took place 
roughly 530 million years ago, it was not a volcano, not an asteroid strike. To me, though, it's as earth-shaking as a volcano. You see, the Cambrian explosion is when creatures suddenly appeared, suddenly, at least by evolutionary standards. The suddenness of it is the reason it's called an explosion. Again, 530 million years ago, life forms showed up with spinal cords, compound eyes, articulated limbs, organs, and even skeletons. Some of these creatures still exist, although well over 99% of all species that ever existed are now extinct. We hear about intelligent design as being responsible for life. You can decide how intelligent creation seems when almost 100% of all created life forms go extinct. Over 99%. The timing is also of some interest. An outburst of life 530 million years ago should be thought-provoking. What a challenge there is to square that with a six to 8,000 year old creation event. On the other hand, this looked like a curveball for the theory of evolution. Did I hear someone mention Darwin earlier? Charles Darwin didn't have the resources of today. The swift appearance of complex trilobites in the Cambrian fossils presented a challenge to his theory of evolution. Additional exploration of fossils and advanced microscopy made his theory open to question. However, DNA similarity, similarities argue in favor of a common ancestry. Or, there is the argument that DNA shows a common creator. The trilobite is an extinct arthropod. There were varieties of them all around the world. They look something like that. 17,000 species of this animal have been classified. Their fossils are still being found in Australia, France, Canada, and even Dayton, Ohio, and Cincinnati, Ohio. The largest of these ever known was found in Canada, about 27 inches long. <laughs> we can all see that some varieties of birds consume insects and seeds. They can be said to be destroying life. On the other hand, birds can do great service for plants as they distribute undigested seeds to new territories, sometimes far away from the parent plant. <coughs> Insects themselves can be vicious destroyers of seedlings and adult plants. Those pesky bugs, they can eat away at our ornamental plants, can't they, sweetie? They sure can. They sure can. However, they can be effective in spreading pollen to advance a particular plant species. And how about the plants? We see examples of leaves overgrowing competitor leaves to steal the light from the sun, perfectly willing to kill anything in its shadow. We humans as a species have our own story. We cultivate and then we harvest. We nurture and then we slaughter for our benefit to meet our needs. Killing animals, sometimes it can really grip your heart. When a California gray whale and her new calf try to migrate up the coast and the orcas attack the baby, we know it's wrong. The whale is just so majestic that it's just wrong for these cute sea world shamus to come and attack that uh, baby and, and kill it. Everywhere we look in the natural world, we find a struggle. Natural selection is at play. We humans hardly appear to be struggling as, as we sit here today. We spend much of our lives in indoor comfort, but each of us are in struggles. 
with pathogens right now. Most of these struggles won't be conscientiously observed, but the germs are there trying to get us. So do you see Mother Nature or Father God, it's your choice, has been very cruel to life on this planet. That can make you think. Humans have stepped on toes for sure. The dodo bird is one of many cases, but nature has slaughtered the animal kingdom. Well over 99% extinction, and that's without human involvement. Okay, back to Ohio. Cincinnati was under 600 feet of seawater during the time of the trilobites. Of current living animals, the, the closest thing to a trilobite is the horseshoe crab, except that trilobites had eyes with hundreds of combs. Each comb had multiple lenses these earliest known eyes of 530 million years ago were more complete than most of today's eyes, more complicated. I mean, it's only just some of the flies now that have more complicated eyes, dragonflies in particular. The Cambrian explosion challenged the simple to complex theory. It did. Humans have 46 chromosomes, but surprisingly, Cambrian, microscopic, animal-like radiolaria, and this is magnified thousands of times. I could squeeze it right here. Radiolaria had 800 chromosomes. 46, 800. At least this is what's known from the surviving species of this tiny organism. Some of them have survived. So the 150-year-old idea that early organisms were simple, single-cell animals morphing into multicellular organisms, it's a bit more strained when finally viewed through an electron microscope. Complex life exploded onto the scene. Life is just infinitely more complex than Darwin could have dreamed. Sometimes that just happens. We acquire knowledge and then discover there's so much that we don't know. The Cambrian period is such an important time in history. Almost 95% of all phyla, which is general life types, quickly appeared, and most of them don't have ancestors that are known. Furthermore, phyla pretty much stopped showing up after that time. This paleontology stuff, it's hard to nail down. After all, it was a long time ago. We're missing transitional forms between invertebrates and fish. Scientists expected they'd be there. They hoped they'd be there. But they're not being found. Here's an example of how tough it can be to get the science right. In 1972, Skull 1470 was discovered in Kenya. And I just happen to have the real one right here. <laughs> so I'm going to pass this around. Uh, it, this would be one of your few chances in life to uh, handle something this important. So, so here it goes. <laughs> it was carefully dated to be 2.6 million years old. But this caused some anthropologists to object because it would mean that this human-like skull was older than any other supposed transitional forms. So it was later redated to a million years younger. That's outright embarrassing for science. But on the other hand, a million years younger sounds like the fountain of youth to me. Ponce de Leon down there looking for the fountain of youth. There it is right there. Took a million years off of his life. Mahalo, Skull 1470. Scientists continue to challenge each other's conclusions about this skull. Experts have criticized each other's conclusions about reconstruction techniques, about the protrusion uh, at the eyebrows, uh, about cranial size, about missing fragments, and the bony lip support. 
They have tried to see if they can agree on that skull's significance. Really, it can be a contentious and messy business. In the 1800s, German scientist Ernst Haeckel's imagination ran wild. You'll need your binoculars for this one. These are embryos. He said, Val, I think that all the embryos are similar. So if you think I did a good job with uh, German there, thank you. <laughs> uh, I might try out for a Sergeant Schultz part or something. something. Uh, there's no need for you to applaud my scholarly German. Scientists later determined that he was providing distorted images of embryos. Intentional? Intentional or not? Well, anyway, it falsely connected various species. You know, he's showing essentially the same embryo becoming a turtle, a chicken, a human. His findings were discredited. This process is more complicated still when there is outright falsification. This has to be the most famous hoax in paleontology. In 1912, Piltdown Man, somebody's nodding their head, Piltdown Man was discovered in England and it was thought to be maybe the greatest archaeological find ever. This man was just a jawbone and some skull fragments, but the bone supposedly proved that man had evolved from apes. This was touted as the missing link. It was over 40 years later, in 1953, before fluorine testing showed the skull to be only 600 years old. <laughs> And to further insult science, the jaw was learned to be a filed orangutan bone. <laughs> Not even close to being of human origin. The bones had been stained with uh, potassium bichromate for a more prehistoric appearance. The perpetrators of this hoax, they were long since deceased. Are they still laughing at us from the grave or from heaven or from hell? Another discovery was Nebraska man in 1917. It became not so interesting when this man turned out to be only the remnants of a pig. So that silliness was quickly discredited. Here's another missing link. Flipperpithecus. Can you pronounce that? Flipperpithecus. Some fo fossils are called something pithecus. The pithecus part is from the Greek word meaning ape or monkey. Oh, I just, just happened to have uh, the real one here, flipper pithecus. This was supposedly a five million year old piece of human collarbone. It was exposed in 1983 when it was, de it was determined to be a section of a dolphin rib. No. Remember Flipper, the movie star dolphin? They call him Flipper, Flipper, faster than lightning, blah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's it, it's, it's a joke, Flipper Pithecus, but it was a hoax. So what's my point? Scientists will sometimes come up with absolute nonsense. While most anthropologists are sincerely trying to solve the mysteries of early man, a scientist is not scientific when every impulse is to label every bone fragment as prehistoric man. Skeletons and skull variations are very pronounced within our living species now. Look around you. Even in this room, there are significant variations. So determining if a skull is a missing link based on shape, that's yeah, difficult at best. Hopefully though, such goals as quick prestige, fame and funding for research grants won't continue to get in the way of honest science. Now here's where my observations may cost me friends in this humanist crowd. Now, if I'm not mistaken, some of the things that Virginia was carrying in was uh, a bag of rotten tomatoes and she's, she's pretty close here, so, so <laughs> this may give me some trouble. I hope it doesn't happen again. I always hate when that happens, when the tomatoes come. <laughs> Compared to the Earth's estimated age of four and a half billion years, 530 million years old, the, Cambr the Cambrian period, eh, it's not that long ago. 
The enormous climate variations which have taken place without the help of humans have been natural changes. Ohio under 600 feet of seawater? That's way more drastic than whatever ocean rise may take place in a global warming scenario. But Virginia and I have talked about this. Uh, global warming is no longer the mantra. Now we speak of climate change because some areas of the earth are cooling. Could that mean that human impact is not significant? Well, obviously. Human consumption and industrialization play a part in the climate. Absolutely. However, our role at least appears to be minor compared to what nature usually throws at us. We've heard about the prehistoric ice age. <clears throat> Drastic for sure. But more recently, Pope Innocent VIII, there's the gentleman, he blamed witches for the Little Ice Age and the resulting famine of the 1400s. So maybe a quarter million European witches were burned because of their evil ways. That's some bad religion for you. One crummy Bible verse. I've gotten to the point, you know, I have a history as a Christian, but I've gotten to the point I can speak of crummy Bible verses. And this is one, Exodus 22, 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And this was the backbone of killing all these witches. So we kill a couple hundred thousand women, sometimes leaving their children to starve. Hmm. Moving on. I don't ever want to be ecologically irresponsible if for no other reason it would be unfair to my grandchildren and to you and to your grandchildren. Evolution does not explain the presence of life on this planet. Darwin knew that. Evolution only explains the transition from one life form to another, happening at a very slow pace. That's so different from explaining the origins of life itself. Darwin's book was about the origin of the species. There it is. Not the origin of life. So, how did life forms start? What's the reason for our lives? What happens to us after we die? Here's my scientific answer. I don't know for sure. Can't know for sure. In fact, I think it's impossible for anybody to know for sure. So either God has given man dominion over this earth and man is to subdue it for now, or we're just somehow here naturally and we do our best to find our way Let's at least agree that humans are obviously very special. Very lucky to be here. 99% extinction, we're very lucky to be here. And we have the responsibility, responsibility to manage what we've been given. That's part of a humanist job. We can see humans looking to religion for the answers, and maybe we'll talk more about that later sometime. But for now, well, as humans, we have our challenges. Nature throws so much at us. We are bombarded with religious myths. I see the humanist philosophy as reconciling these things by being good citizens of the earth. Should you wean yourself off of fossil fuels? Should you use LED lighting when it's affordable? Especially, though, can we be kind to one another? Even when we don't feel like being kind to one another. Will that help our grandchildren? I think it will. And remember, happiness is extremely affordable. It's a mindset. It's so affordable, in fact, it's free! Okay, thank you.